Today we're going to talk about an 83-year-old gentleman I know who was on statins. Is it appropriate for him to be on statins? Let's find out. Stay tuned. This is Jeff. Well, not really. This is a stock photo of someone like Jeff. And the Jeff we're looking at today is not his real name anyway. But I thought it'd be good to have a name and a face to go along with our story, which is based on a real person. He is 83 years old and on statins. Is that appropriate? According to a report published by the American College of Cardiology, lack of robust research evidence examining statins in primary prevention and practical considerations of geriatric population health, which includes potential side effects of statins, cost effectiveness of therapy, and competing risks in life expectancy, weigh towards low prescription rates of statins in older populations. Well, that was a mouthful, but just from this we might suggest that no, it's not appropriate for Jeff to be on statins. But of course, Everyone watching this should be shouting, whoa, wait a minute. I just committed two sins. First, the venial sin of cherry picking a quote, which was from a caption to a diagram within a cited paper, to bolster the case against statins. That's called citing proof text. We're both arguing from authority and seriously lacking meaningful context at this point. Worse yet, I committed a mortal sin by treating Jeff as if he is just an instance of a generic 83 year old. I haven't told you anything meaningful about his circumstances. This is as bad as when a doctor looks at a total cholesterol level and says, you need to be on a statin. To look at Jeff and say, you're 83, you shouldn't be on a statin, is just as egregious. Let's learn more about Jeff. Jeff had a heart attack at age 58, at which time he was put on a comprehensive cardiac health program which included dietary changes, exercise improvements, and statins. His prior heart attack makes him a high-risk patient, and this is why we say he's in secondary prevention. So our proof text is inapplicable right from the start. Jeff is not a primary prevention patient. Such patients have an average yearly risk of 5-7% to for a repeat heart attack, with that risk increasing each year as the years go by. Now this is still a population statistic, but at least we're narrowing Jeff's population, making it a little more focused. Jeff has gone 25 years without a follow-up heart attack. And finally, Jeff reports no discernible adverse effects from taking statins. Is he right? Maybe he's attributing statin adverse effects to aging, but to be honest, I look at the real Jeff and I wouldn't guess that he is as old as he is. I would have guessed he was in his early 70s. The point is, only Jeff can make this judgment for himself. We started out by treating Jeff as simply an 83-year-old male. Jeff is more than that. The likelihood of Jeff going 25 years without another heart attack, assuming he changed nothing about his health, is exceedingly small. A simple extrapolation of a 5-7% to annual risk over 25 years means somewhere between a 3-4 and four and a 6-7 and seven chance that he would have had another heart attack by now, and that's not even considering a natural risk increase with age. If we account for that by increasing his risk by as little as 0.2% per year, his chances of avoiding a heart attack, again by not changing anything, is minuscule. And even while secondary prevention statistics are sometimes overstated, statins do help many people. Those of us who have been hurt by statins or improperly prescribed statins need to keep in mind that not everyone has the same experience as us. I think of how I experienced severe adverse effects only to later learn that I would never have agreed to take them had I been properly informed about the risks and benefits. But I'm not Jeff. I managed to get past age 58 without having a heart attack. We also have to consider Jeff's feelings about this whole thing. He understands that his comprehensive cardiovascular health plan is impacted by his better dietary choices, increased exercise, and use of statins. It's nearly impossible to determine for an individual how much each component of his health program really contributed to his success. But here's the kicker. Jeff is comfortable with his treatment. Why in the world would we suggest that Jeff should not continue to follow this plan? Here's two major conclusions from all of this. First, statin decisions require individualized assessment. Each of the nine recommendations in the guidelines that suggest statin use should have this sentence at the end of every recommendation directed at the prescribing physician. If statin therapy is indicated by this guideline, do your damn job and investigate further, considering the patient's history, values, carotid intima media thickness test results, coronary artery calcium score, and other indicators. Provide the patient with unbiased information and enter into and respect a true shared decision. We shouldn't discount Jeff's personal experience of his situation. 
If we do, we're as guilty as the trolls and doctors who tell us that our adverse effects are caused by the nocebo effect or definitely not caused by statins, usually based on knowing next to nothing about us or our experience. Such discounting of our experiences and values by them towards us or us towards Jeff displays extreme hubris. My doctor based her statin recommendation on limited data, total cholesterol over 200 milligrams per deciliter or 5.2 millimoles per liter, and ignored or overlooked obvious adverse effects. She spent more time spouting phrases like statins don't cause that than she did listening to me. For my closing thoughts, let's not forget these two lessons about individualized care and the patient's personal experience being of paramount importance. Jeff may make a different statin decision than we would in our own situation, or we would if we were in his situation. Not fully respecting his decision means we make as much a mockery of the shared decision-making concept as the mainstream medical community currently does. When a doctor says, don't worry, I'll still treat you when you have a stroke because we decline statins, that's not shared decision-making and it's not good medicine. Let's not make the same mistake as those so-called doctors. That's all I've got on this topic. If you appreciate this content, please like, share, and comment. And if you haven't seen this video, I recommend you take a look at it now. Thanks for listening.